For a thousand years, kings and queens of Europe had absolute power. But absolute power corrupts absolutely. Greed, revenge, sex, madness, witchcraft, murder. Every monarch had their royal secrets. For many royals, wielding immense power was not enough. They wanted recognition. Some monarchs sought to bask in the adulation of great deeds. Others hid their inner feelings behind glorious facades. Louis XIV, the French Sun King, built the greatest palace in Europe. England's Elizabeth I hid her lonely soul behind a glorious mask, while medieval Edward I battered his way into history. All found their own way to the fields of glory. Jousting was the sport of kings in the Middle Ages, a test of manhood, bravery and warrior skills. As the ladies of the court looked on, nobles and royalty pitted their strength in mock combat, according to the strict code of chivalry. In the 13th century, young King Edward I was among the jousting champions of England, but for Edward, tourneys and jousts were mere pageantry. The fierceness he learned on the jousting field was a rehearsal for a reign that would glorify Edward in bloody battle. Born in 1239, Edward was a man with a vision of glory for his kingdom. His drive was so intense, he ordered his bones to be carried into battle if he were ever killed in combat. Edward's ambitions were stirred when he traveled through Europe to fight in the Crusades. As he met Europe's powerful kings, Edward realized he had to unify Britain if England were ever to achieve greatness. Edward's dream was nothing less than turning Britain into a major power in European history. And that ambition would cost blood. For centuries, the Welsh and Scots refused to accept English kings as their overlords. Edward moved to conquer them. The king traveled for days across the country to meet his army, snatching sleep in his chainmail suit when he could. When he arrived, he took command and ordered an encirclement of the Welsh. Fierce battles erupted. The Welsh, famed for their longbows and guerrilla tactics, fought back, but were no match for the lances of Edward's heavy cavalry. The first step in creating a major world power ended in victory for Edward. To keep the Welsh under control, Edward imposed his will in stone and iron. He built a ring of fortresses around Wales and installed loyal English barons to keep guard. This massive, impregnable castle of Carnarvon was the embodiment of Edward's determination to build a truly united Britain. Carnarvon Castle stamped Edward's dominion on the landscape, reminding potential rebels of the grand power of the English throne. Inside the walls of the castle, Edward and his followers were safe, but life there was far from luxurious. The castle was wet, cold, and cramped. 
The food was poor, and this was the sanitary facility, vertical chutes used as latrines. Nobody washed, not even the king, and their lice-infested coats were hung over the latrine so that ammonia fumes from the sewage would kill the parasites. Edward's plans for a glorious, united Britain were only half realized by his victory over the Welsh. The king had yet to subdue Scotland. Edward's dream of national unity spurred him to such fearsome campaigns that he became known as the Hammer of the Scots. On one occasion, he refused to leave the field when his horse was killed under him, fighting on until his opponents were beaten. But King Edward I was not to see victory, dying before the Scots were subdued. In a final gesture, Edward extended his will beyond life by ordering his remains to be carried into battle against the Scots until they were defeated. Before he died, Edward sealed his glory by making his son, Edward II, the first Prince of Wales a title passed down through each generation of British royalty and still held by the heir to the throne to this day. By subduing the Scots and the Welsh, Edward I set the goal many English monarchs pursued after him, a drive to unify the nation into one united kingdom and set the stage for England to become a world power. Four hundred years after Edward's reign, his legacy of national ambition lived on when the throne of England passed to a monarch determined to leave a blaze of glory, Elizabeth I. Elizabeth ruled over England's golden age at the end of the 16th century. English explorers commanded the seas, claiming and settling much of the new world as royal possessions. William Shakespeare wrote plays at the Globe Theater, many in honor of good Queen Bess. But in her quest for power and glory, Elizabeth paid a personal price. And her tragedies started when she was only a young girl. Elizabeth's father, Henry VIII, executed her mother, Anne Boleyn, and then declared Elizabeth illegitimate. The Pope excommunicated her. Her older sister became the Catholic Queen Mary and imprisoned Elizabeth because she was a Protestant sympathizer. Worst of all, she was a woman at a time when women were meant to bear children, not rule nations. Elizabeth was 25 when her older sister Mary died and Elizabeth assumed the throne unchallenged. The new queen was young, graceful and elegant and she was aware that projecting the image of power was as important as holding power itself. She liked to be known as Gloriana and the Sun Queen. She dressed in jewels and pearls. One outfit alone was adorned with over 300 gemstones. She was constantly losing rubies, emeralds, pearls and sapphires which fell from her clothes as she walked. She owned over 500 gowns and skirts, 125 petticoats and 27 jewel-encrusted fans. Her jewellery collection was said to be the richest and most varied in Europe. As soon as she was crowned, Elizabeth was deluged with offers of marriage. Russian Tsar Ivan the Terrible sought her hand, as did Eric XIV of Sweden. Even Philip II of Spain, the most powerful man in Europe, toyed with the idea. But her secret love was probably the handsome young Robert Dudley, Earl of Leicester, a childhood friend. Elizabeth secretly kept a locket with Dudley's portrait that she marked as my Lord's picture, but her Lord was already married. Marriage to any man posed a problem for the Queen. When Elizabeth summoned her first parliament, she declared, now that the public care of governing the kingdom is laid upon me, to draw upon me also the cares of marriage may seem a point of inconsiderate folly. 
Yea, to satisfy you, I have already joined myself in marriage to a husband, namely the Kingdom of England. Then she displayed her coronation ring. To me, it shall be a full satisfaction, both for the memorial of my name and for my glory also, if when I shall let my last breath, it be engraved upon my marble tomb, here lies Elizabeth, who reigned a virgin and died a virgin. Just a young woman when she spoke those words, Elizabeth kept her promise as she set out to establish a glorious reign. When Philip II of Spain, her rejected suitor, launched an invasion of England, Elizabeth seized her chance to show her true glory. In 1588, a massive Spanish armada of 130 ships and 17,000 soldiers sailed up the English Channel to attack England. As the armada approached, Elizabeth traveled to visit her troops. I am come amongst you, not for my recreation and disport, but being resolved in the midst and heat of battle to live and die amongst you all, to lay down my honor and my blood even in the dust, for my God, my kingdom, and my people. I know I have the body of a weak and feeble woman, but I have the heart and stomach of a king, and a king of England too. The fast, well-armed British fighting ships ripped into the huge, clumsy, invading galleons, causing mayhem and routing the Spanish. It was Elizabeth's most glorious hour. As her fame spread throughout Europe, everyone wanted her portrait. But Elizabeth was growing older and her looks were fading. She refused to sit for artists, but the Queen knew she had to keep up her public image as a vital and powerful ruler. She had this official pattern of her face made up. As a result, hundreds of near-identical portraits were produced, reflecting not the true Elizabeth, but a public relations image of an idealized, ageless sovereign. Elizabeth's official face gradually became a lie, and her real face disappeared beneath growing layers of powdered eggshell, alum, poppy seeds, and white lead. Yet somehow, one portrait managed to slip through the net of official censorship. It showed a tired, deeply wrinkled face and an ill-fitting wig over a balding head. A far cry from the many official portraits painted the same year. Try as Elizabeth could to maintain a glorious facade, she gradually decayed from within. Her teeth turned black and her hair fell out. Though the public Elizabeth was still adored by her subjects, the private Elizabeth grew ever more lonely. But the Queen was still susceptible to flattery, and at the age of 57 she fell for the stepson of her old favorite Dudley. Handsome and half her age, the Earl of Essex charmed Elizabeth. She gave Essex the command of her army in rebellious Ireland, but he disobeyed the Queen's orders and ended up rebelling against her. Elizabeth was devastated, but as Queen she had no alternative but to punish Essex. She sent him to the Tower to be executed. Before his death, Essex wrote spitefully, Being now an old woman, she was no less crooked and distorted in mind than she was in body. In the last months of her life, sadness overwhelmed Elizabeth. She had all the mirrors in her rooms removed, so she wasn't reminded of time's ravages and of glory past. Elizabeth died in March 1603. She was 69. A thousand mourners followed her cortege to Westminster Abbey. Elizabeth's marble face was carved from her death mask, the true likeness of a queen whose real face few ever saw. Her epitaph was not as the virgin queen, but as the mother of her country, 
for glorious endowment both in mind and body, a prince incomparable. Forty years after Elizabeth's glorious reign ended, across the channel a prince was born who would become France's most glorious monarch. But the start of his reign promised nothing but ignominy. Before dawn on a February morning in 1651, the boy king woke to hear the furious roar of an angry mob rioting against rising taxes. They were breaking into his palace. His first thought was of escape. The servants could lead him to safety through secret passages. But the mob was already at his bedroom door and it was too late. The only thing he could do was play possum and it saved his life. The mob was so charmed by the sleeping child, it said they left the palace on tiptoes, according to a witness. Whereas they had entered the palace like furies, they left it full of gentleness, asking God with all their hearts to protect their young king, whose presence had the power to charm them. The boy king was Louis XIV of France, who came to the throne at the age of five. His reign was to be the longest and among the most glorious in European history. Louis grew up here in the Palais Royal, in the center of Paris. It was a time of great upheaval. Harvests were bad and taxes were rising. The young King Louis was not even old enough to be crowned. He was besieged not only by the Paris mob, but by his own nobles. Like the poor of Paris, the nobles balked at high taxes. They had private armies, and King Louis had trouble asserting his authority over them. He eventually came to terms with the nobles, but Louis would always fear his overmighty subjects. As a young man, Louis loved hunting in the woods outside Paris. On one of these trips, he had an idea that would counter both his enemies at one stroke. First, move the palace away from the rabble of Paris. And second, make court life so exclusive all the nobles would want to live directly under Louis' control, far from their own armies. The new palace, Versailles, with its grand parks, lakes and paths, was a gargantuan project that took 36,000 workers and 5,000 horses more than a decade to build. At the court of Versailles, Louis imagined himself as the Sun King, the center of the universe. His courtiers were the planets, his subjects the stars. He created a new celestial order and it dazzled all who fell into its orbit. Louis turned every minor detail of daily life into ritual. Even the king's daily dressing was high ceremony, and Louis reduced his nobles to minor roles in his pageant. One duke might hold Louis's nightshirt, a second helped remove it. A prince might have the high honor of handing the king a fresh shirt for the day. Once dressed, Louis held court in a series of state rooms. Dignitaries and ambassadors were ushered up the magnificent state stairway into the Venus or Diana drawing rooms, where they were permitted to pay homage to the Sun King. Glorious palace balls took place here, in the Hall of Mirrors. Its furnishings were all gold and silver, lit by 4,000 candles set on shimmering crystal chandeliers. Louis made Versailles so glorious that a noble who failed to attend court became a nobody. Nobles basked in the reflection of Louis's glory and caused him no more trouble. But beneath the glittering facade, all was not well. Louis himself remarked, the vocation of kingship is great, noble and delightful, but it is not without hardships, exhaustion, 
anxiety. Sometimes the uncertainty drives one to despair. For all its glory, Versailles was not cozy. Kitchens were hundreds of yards from the dining room. By the time food reached the king, it was cold. The chimneys smoked, there was no sanitation in the building, and Louis' hunting dogs ran free inside, fouling the rooms. The great palace stank. And Louis was becoming a shadow of the glorious Sun King he had once been. Because of a failed dental operation, the king was unpleasant to watch at dinner. When he drank, liquid gushed through his nose, and, it was said, flowed from there as from a fountain. And Louis's personal hygiene consisted only of washing his hands with brandy. When he once rebuked his mistress for poor manners, she retorted, At least I do not stink to high heaven as you do. Versailles was to be Louis's crowning glory, but it was also the scene of much grief for the king. In 1681, his official mistress was found to be practicing black magic on him. She was discreetly exiled. Two years later, Louis's wife died, followed quickly by his son and heir, his daughter-in-law, and finally his grandson. And Louis was constantly ill. Toothaches, headaches, and fevers plagued him. An infestation of tapeworms made him a glutton. He ate three chickens at one meal, even when he was dieting. These troubles made Louis depressed and racked with self-doubt. Though he maintained a glorious public facade, underneath, he was sinking into a midlife crisis. All his life, Louis maintained, my greatest concern has always been glory, and Versailles was that supreme achievement. But his children wanted no part of the Grand Palace. The royal youth fled Versailles for the bright lights of Paris, the city Louis once feared. Even the nobility grew to feel less duty-bound to attend court at Versailles. Alone and widowed, in 1684, Louis secretly married his children's nanny, the austere but kindly Madame de Maintenon. As his children left and his glorious court at Versailles waned, the Sun King sought comfort in Maintenon's matronly arms. She noted, Here I am alone with him. I must bear his troubles if he has any, his sadness, his nervous dejection. Sometimes he bursts into tears which he cannot control, or else he complains of illness. Louis showed a desperate affection for her. Whatever love you have for me, I have even more for you. But the whole of my heart is at your disposal. As death approached, Louis could not resist one last flourish. His last recorded words were, I lived among the people of my court. I want to die among them. They have followed the course of my whole life, and it is only fair that they see me die. Gentlemen, it would not be fair that the pleasure that I have in prolonging these last moments in your company should keep you from your dinner. I bid you farewell and beg you to go and eat. Louis' reign lasted 72 years, the longest in European history, and in his old age the king, whose greatest concern had been glory, realized true fulfillment lay in the comfort of old friends and close family. Louis XIV, the Sun King, Elizabeth I, the Virgin Queen, Edward I, Hammer of the Scots, each monarch attained their ambition to make a mark on history. Whatever path they took, they sacrificed their all for the ultimate goal of glory.